Every morning I have to struggle uh, with getting up. It's really hard for me. And there's so much to do. Yeah, just thinking about it. You know, I want to go back to bed. Um, and it continued until now, until uh, a while like this, until my nephew came along this year. Um, and uh, he's now six and a half. And he's the same. And he's never seen me do it, you see. He has never seen me stick my foot out to make my mom put on my socks. And he does the same thing. So now guess what my mom thinks? My mom thinks, hold on, so it's in the genes. How can this be in the genes? So she has this idea now that it's not nurture but nature. But how can such a weird thing be encoded in the genes? Um, I still struggle. My nephew struggles. And to me, it's about, you know, I love my dreams. I love dreaming away. I like that darkness when everything is possible. And then you come out of that. There's light, a lot of it. A lot of beautiful things, but a lot of ugly things too. And then you think to yourself, how do I make it better? How do I make this world a better place? And it's a struggle every day. And it's still a struggle for me. Um, I'm a night person. I really am. Um, I call this bright gray. It's a little more than white, but less than black. It's something like, it's, m it's more than kin, as Shakespeare said. It's a little more than kin. So it's a little more than genes. But it's less than kind. I wish I had, didn't have it. And I wish, my, I wish that my uh, nephew didn't have it either. But so it is. Uh, this struggle between, in my life between light and darkness uh, continued until, well, it still continues, but continued until when I was at CERN. I uh, helped build the Atlas detector at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And I worked underground for three years. I have a lot of sympathy with the mine workers. Uh, you go underground at 8 a.m. Uh, and you get out at 8 p.m. and it's dark again. And there's no sunlight for three years. And that's some, something what we, you know, all of CERN had to do uh, because all the big detectors are underground and you have to build them underground, you have to cable it, you have to calibrate it, you have to do all that stuff all underground. And here is me, I think, looking pretty tired. Would you agree? <laughs> and um, the way to see the light, the way to uh, see some sunlight, otherwise everybody gets depressed, is to go skiing. Because Geneva, it turns out, is between these mountain ranges called the Jura and the Alps. And being between these two mountain ranges, you get a lot of clouds that sit on the city of Geneva, and you don't get the sunlight at all, especially during winter. So the best way is to go up all the way up <laughs> to 3,000 meters, where there's sunlight no matter what, more or less, or there's light, more, more or less. There's less cloud coverage anyways. And to go skiing. So I had to learn skiing, because that's what everybody does. This wasn't a choice, but I came to love it. I loved the mountains, and I absolutely adored it. So here was I was in 2005, starting my first skiing class ever. And our class instructor, uh, a CERN guy, a very French CERN technician, uh, had no pity on me whatsoever. And we had to follow him in the same exact tracks he was going, and he could go anywhere, down a block even, in the first course. And after, on the fifth lesson, the last lesson, I had a really bad crash. I tore my inner lateral ligament on my left leg. I was taken to the Geneva Hospital, where the doctor took one, one look at my left legs, my, 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 my left knee, and said to me, you have extendable um, uh, joints. You shouldn't be skiing at all. So I went through some really painful therapy, and guess what happened? Next season, I was back on the slopes, because I loved it. I had caught the bug, as they say. Three years later, 
fast forward, I'm still skiing. Uh, I'll bite this knee problem. Okay, my knees are bad. My knees are biologically bad. It's genes, they said. They said, my mom has bad knee genes. I've got bad knee genes. My nephew has bad knee genes, I've been told. Uh, but I'm a physicist. I think, you know, hey, I know my F is equal to MA. I, can, I know gravity. I can fight this out. So um, there was a day of whiteout. I was, it was a uh, Christmas holiday in Geneva and I came back to Turkey for the weekend, uh, for, the Christ for Christmas. <laughs> and for the weekend with my mom, uh, I took my mom, my mom doesn't ski, but I took her along anyways, um, just for the hell of it. And she was with me in Kartalkaya. And uh, a whiteout um, is a perfect example of bright gray. It is when it's so bright and there's so much fog, you can't see anything. Light reflects off of every single water molecule there is in air, and you just can't see anything. It's a whiteout. Here I was in a whiteout, and I just heard this voice. I just heard somebody coming from the back. I was standing on the side, and he just hit me. Breaking four bones, uh, collapsing my lungs, having a lot of hemorrhage. Oh, I shouldn't continue. I don't want to. But I was in the hospital for a while, let's just say. Uh, had some operations. I couldn't go to work for about a month and a half. I couldn't go back to Geneva either. Um, and I was in a lot of pain. I couldn't dress myself. I'm, so, I'm just so used to being self-sufficient. I had lived abroad by myself since I was 17. Um, not being able to dress myself was just unbelievable, unthinkable. I was losing my mind. And, um, and the worst thing is, in Geneva, you have to drive. Uh, I, I mean, I lived on the French side, and I had to drive to work. And my biggest fear was that somebody, the car behind would, would, would come and hit me. So I couldn't drive. I was just so stressed about driving. So I went and saw a psychologist, and the psychologist said, the only way you're going to beat this is if you went skiing. 105 days after the accident, 105 days, all right? Imagine four broken bones, huh? I was in a lot of pain, but I went skiing. On the last day that the slopes closed, 13th of April, 2008, here I, I am on a glacier, for God's sakes, all right? Off piste, where nobody, there's nobody else. I took my best friend with me. There's nobody else on the slopes. It's a Monday, we took the day off so that there would be nobody, because I'm so scared of somebody hitting me I asked him to, to, to ski in front of me, and I'm just following him. And we went down to this beautiful glacier. It's called the Argentier Glacier. And um, I continued skiing. I've been continuing since. I've been skiing since. I just go off piste. I just don't go on piste where somebody can hit me. You go around the rules a bit. You know, you find your own way. You don't have to always stick to the rules. And, I, and of course, I know it's dangerous to ski off piste. And it's often forbidden to go off piece, but so it is. I go off piece, and I, I love the mountains so much that I share it now with my students. This is the Mont Blanc, and this is my research group now from Metu. We went up there this summer, and I love the mountains. Here's another photo I took of Verbier, and I think you can see why I love it. It's just breathtaking. I just feel closer to God. Yes, thank you. Uh, but not just God, to the very foundation of why I'm here, I see from everything from above. There is that white out, you see? I'm above that white out. I feel that I'm above that un unknown land where I don't have control over everything. There's too much information to be processed. And I'm above it all. I get that feeling. And it gives me goosebumps just saying that to you. Um, and this all ties in really with my work in a very strange way. Let's see if I can make that connection for you. So I worked, I've spent uh, many years working at the Large Hadron Collider on an experiment called ATLAS. I think um, you've heard about it, uh, about CERN. But for those of you who have never seen it before, here is a photo of the Large Hadron Collider. It's a 27-kilometer ring, 100 meters underground in Geneva. And that's like Geneva, 
That's the Jura Mountains. You can also see a bit of the airport there. I also have some extremely good news. Uh, yesterday, the, director, the new Director General of CERN was elected, and it's going to be a female for the first time in CERN's history. It's Fabiola Gianotti. Uh, she's a wonderful person, and I hope we, can, we will host her in Turkey in the next few years. We hosted the last Director General, so we hope to get this one too. Um, and uh, while well, we've gotten really famous now with the discovery of the Higgs particle, here is Dr. Higgs with this famous equation that you may or may not be able to understand, and even those people who claim to understand it may not understand it completely. Um, what does it look like? Here is a collision. Particles, protons, very, very, very close to the speed of light collide at the center of the atlas detector. How close to the speed of light, you might say? So close to the speed of light that it's only a bicycle speed away from the speed of light. Now, how close exactly is the speed of light? Well, imagine you're here now, and you go to uh, Ankara Airport, uh, Ankara Istanbul Airport. If you could go and come back from Ankara Istanbul Airport 10,000 times in one second, that's the speed of light for you. Okay, now imagine going only a bicycle speed away from it. That's really not that much difference, is there? Um, so you take these two particles, two protons, that are now extremely feeling extremely massive, much more massive than they are at rest. They feel about 7,000 times more heavy than they would now. I wouldn't want to be that particle, would you? <laughs> I'm quite happy with my weight as it is. Um, so imagine, don't imagine, just think of protons feeling 7,000 times more heavy than they are, and then they collide head on with another one like that. And then comes E is equal to mc squared and all that wonderful stuff, that magic, all that magic that nature does naturally. And what happens is you get extra particles that are created at that moment. And these particles here, this collision, see what happens is two particles collide like this and things come out perpendicular to it, okay? That's the collision that we're in interested in. So here was a particle that went in, there was a particle going out like this, and they went boom. This, this event, by the way, could be, a, could be the result of a Higgs particle, which won the Nobel Prize, as you know, the discovery of which won the Nobel Prize last year. But what's th we face a big whiteout in particle physics. Here's the whiteout where I'm talking about. It's too much information. Higgs particle is so rare. You get about one per hour if you make 40 million collisions per second. It's such a rare thing to be produced. It's a rarity of nature. So imagine that you have 40 million collisions per second and you have in each collision the information that you read from the detector, okay? From the CTEC, you read some information. That's 150 million bits of information. If you multiply that, you get a petabyte per second. Now, you may not be very familiar with petabyte, but Google stores about 20 petabytes right now in total. All right, so you get Google worth in about 20 seconds. Not bad. Or it's uh, a million gigabytes per second. So in my mind, these things go hand in hand. In my mind, it's a complete whiteout of information. How do you pick the right collision? How do you find that one particle per hour that comes out of this huge mess? And what we design is something called a trigger system. We don't take every single collision there is. It's a bit like the soccer game when you know there are 10 videos pointing at the soccer field and there is this one guy who actually picks which, which video gets streamed out. It's done all live. It's a bit like that. We do this live as well. We do have a trigger system which immediately decides if there's something interesting. What we do is very simple. We look whether there is something went boom at right angles to the collision. Okay, if a collision looks like this, it's not interesting for us. If it looks like boom, boof, it's interesting for us. Right? 
And now we only write about 2,000 events per second to disk. So imagine that reduction. That's the biggest reduction you can find in data, practically. And I was in charge of that system for about four years. So what have I been looking for? I've been looking for something called dark matter. So this is another example of collision. So what does dark matter look like? Dark matter is even worse than the Higgs particle. It's, part, it's a particle that you cannot see. All right? The dark matter particle, there is about 10 to 200 going through this room, by the way, right now, at about 300 kilometers per second. We even know its speed. Okay, we know how much of the universe is dark matter. About 25% of the universe is dark matter. We, we don't know its particle nature. And what would it look like in one of our collisions? It would look like a particle that wasn't there. So how do you see a particle that isn't there? Well, the wonderful thing is there's this thing called momentum conservation. If you scratch your head back to your high school books, no, never mind. Here's another example. Uh, if you think, think of a billiard table and the first hit, you put the balls into this triangle. Imagine that two, one, one of those balls is unseen. Okay, I hit it and they, go all, they all go in different places. If I add up all of the balls and how they went, I can imagine, I, I can notice that something went, must have gone that way to set all the velocities, additions correct, okay? Imagine a piece that went missing. You will notice it from the moment of the other ones. So this is what it looks like. Generally in a collision, like this one, when you add it all up, add well, for those of you who remember some of your high school stuff, when you add up all the vectors, they add to zero. <laughs> for those of you who don't, when you look at this, if I take this blue thing out, it looks like something must have gone that way, but you don't see it. So this is what dark matter would have looked like in our detector. So we actually designed triggers to look for certain signatures because there are 40 million collisions per second. How do you look for something if you don't know what it will look like? It's very hard. So what we have been doing for the last four years at the Large Hadron Collider is we've been killing theories. Often, what we have to do, much like in our personal life, is we have to say, no, that won't do, that won't do, that won't do, that won't do, that won't do. You kill theories, much like you kill perspective futures. And then you look at what you've got left and maybe you'll never get there. Maybe you will. And if you look at, if you try to, but it's still better, but it's still better than the whiteout. At least you're looking for something. Thank you very much. <laughs>